It goes without saying that the Nintendo DS was one of the most influential handheld gaming devices of all time. Among its many achievements were the normalization of now commonplace features like touchscreens and wireless online multiplayer, and for many who grew up in the 2000s like myself, it stands as a reminder of simpler, more carefree times. In this video, we'll be taking a look at the DS through a different set of eyes, shifting our perspective to explore it from a developer's point of view with the help of a unique and fascinating piece of hardware, the IS Nitro Emulator. What I'll do is first cover some background info on this device before talking a bit about the hardware itself and demoing some functionality, which will include playing some retail games and messing around in the official debugger. I'll try to do my best to explain some of the more technical details, but there's definitely a lot I don't fully understand about this device, so please bear with me through those sections and let me know in the comments if you notice anything I get wrong or don't mention in this video. With that out of the way, let's start with some history. The IS Nitro emulator was developed by Intelligent Systems, yes, that Intelligent Systems, and sold by Nintendo directly to authorized developers through its official developer portal. By pairing it with official DS flashcards, the device could be used to test and debug games mid-development by, as the name implies, emulating the hardware of a Nintendo DS on more advanced technology. The Nitro in the name refers to the internal development name of the DS itself, which is also reflected in the product numbers of Nintendo-produced DS hardware and accessories, as the abbreviation NTR. Intelligent Systems put out a few other pieces of hardware as part of the same Nitro set. The IS Nitro Capture and the elusive IS Nitro Video functioned similarly to the Nitro emulator but had some key features removed. The Nitro Capture had no debug functionality, and the Nitro Video could not interface with PCs at all, and was only able to be used to output game footage to external displays. In addition to those products, the IS Nitro Writer and the IS Nitro Hub were used, respectively, to write to multiple flashcards simultaneously and to emulate local wireless multiplayer over RJ45 Ethernet. The final item in the set, which I only discovered existed while making this video, was the IS Nitro UIC, which interfaced with a PC and a MIDI device and inserted into the Game Boy Advance slot of the DS. It only looks like two of these things have ever been photographed online and they're not documented at all, so I couldn't tell you with any certainty what its purpose was. Maybe it was something related to sound engineering? But focusing back in on the topic of the video, the first model of the Nitro emulator was built using the iconic prototype DS shown at E3 2004. This would have been the model distributed to developers prior to the final DS retail design being landed on. After its release, there was a more common standard variant based on the original DS design and later an updated version with the controller portion built into a DS light shell, bringing with it the enhanced LCD quality of that model. Other upgrades developers could optionally and for a cost include were wireless capability and video output, with the first being an actual hardware modification to the unit, and the second being a simple firmware patch, that cost $400. Nintendo, in addition to providing these configurations up front, also provided the option for units to be upgraded after purchase through a mail-in service. The only method I'm aware of through which developers could officially obtain this hardware was through the aforementioned developer portal. No, not this portal, this portal. Yes, I kid you not, for whatever reason, Nintendo's official developer support site from the late 90s into the early 2010s was called WarioWorld.com, which interestingly was given this name years before a GameCube game of the same name would be released. I checked and this game's North American website was registered as WarioWorld.com with a hyphen. I'm using the Internet Archive to access the developer page, and unfortunately there's this big gap in captures exactly eclipsing the DS's lifespan. Somehow in that span of time though, it went from this fairly charming and attractive site to one that looks very 2000s. If we move past that and look at this one section of a 2013 capture of the site, it can be assumed that the Nitro emulator would have cost at least a couple thousand dollars new, but there doesn't appear to be a catalog publicly available anywhere with exact pricing. After these development units were done being used, developers were expected to either destroy them or send them back to Nintendo to maintain confidentiality, but quite a few developers did not adhere to this policy strictly enough, leading to units hitting the secondhand market in the years to come. 
This brings us to my specific unit, which I bought off of eBay in early 2018 for a cool $180, discounted to $170 after the seller noticed a crack on one of the hinges while packing it. This price is an absolute steal if you have some familiarity with how much machines like this tend to go for. As of making this video, there's only one active listing on eBay for one for about four times that price. These things are scarce enough that there's no real established going price, so you'll see them sell for wildly fluctuating amounts over time. My seller was really helpful in telling me some info about what I bought, but unfortunately I've since lost record of the conversation. Despite this, I definitely remember being told that my emulator came out of a particular Activision subsidiary. I looked it up at the time, and trust me, they made literally zero games of note. This dev was definitely less toward the Call of Duty Guitar Hero end of the spectrum, and more toward the Animal Planet Vet Life Zubal Spring to Life end. Now, I mentioned how I bought this in early 2018. At the time when I bought it, there really wasn't that much information out there about how to get it to do anything of note. Um, I ended up having to do a lot of trial and error testing to get to a point where I could even really communicate with it from a computer. But thankfully since then, there's been a lot more uh, that's been documented about it. So if you do find yourself coming into possession of one of these today, um, there are more resources out there on the internet to help you to get it to do something nicer than, than, than look nice on a shelf. That's a sentence. This brings us to the unit itself. You can see mine is in decent shape with a few scuffs here and there. It seems like a past owner probably slipped up a couple times with a screwdriver while trying to open it up since you have these paint scratches starting at the bases of the screws and extending up the sides. Now, I don't have any of the original packaging, but as I understand it would have been bundled with a software CD, some more of these clip-on ferrite rings to reduce noise on the line to the controller, user manuals, and a GameCube AC adapter. This last item I think is particularly interesting. Intelligent Systems chose to incorporate a GameCube power port and the standard Nintendo AV Multi out, instead of other more generic socket options. I couldn't tell you why it was designed this way, but one side effect it caused was necessitating the separate grounding pin on the outer chassis of the unit since the adapter itself is not grounded at the wall. The rest of the I.O. consists of a back panel with dual AV multi-out ports, an array of dip switches with these functions, a generic rocker power switch, an RJ45 port for wireless communications emulation, and a USB Type-B port for interfacing with a Windows PC. There's a top panel where the game card and GBA cartridge slots are located. This is also where the wireless shark fan antenna would be located if that configuration option had been chosen. On the bottom and left sides, there are some stickers with some identifying model information. You can see mine has the USG box checked, meaning it's the DS Lite version, but does not have support for wireless or video options. We'll get back to that last one later. Finally, on the front panel, there are three status LEDs for indicating power to the overall unit, power to the DS card slot, and power to the GBA cartridge slot, along with a cool little Nintendo sticker featuring their classic red on white logo that they were phasing out at the time this was produced. Whoops. The DS shell itself has inside it completely custom circuitry, and beyond the LCD screens and controls, has very little in common with a retail DS Lite, as it has no independent processing capability. All of the high quality PCB images I'm about to show are taken from a post in the NSMB HD forum by its founder Derbio, which I will post a link to in the description. I wouldn't want to risk taking something like this completely apart myself and potentially breaking something. I don't have any experience with that, but if we do the bare minimum and remove the outer housing, we can see that there are four main boards. A DS CPU board to function as the ARM processor cores of the retail DS, a video board with an FPGA, presumably programmed to process video. A game card emulation board with more FPGAs and a stick of SD RAM where loaded game ROM images get stored. And finally, a main CPU board for controlling overall device functions. The fact that the game ROM is loaded onto SD RAM means that the data gets erased as soon as the device loses power, so there's no chance of finding one of these out in the wild with a program already loaded onto it. So now let's actually get this up and running. I'm going to plug the power cable and connect the USB cord to my desktop, and let's take a look at what this does. I mentioned earlier that my configuration does not have video output enabled, by default, but all of the hardware components needed for this functionality are in fact there, so by using this extraordinarily niche little video enabling tool by Rick Bent on the NSMBHD forum, we can actually enable video output with the press of a button that supports both external displays in a number of different screen arrangements. 
Using this tool is how I've captured gameplay footage for this video, so big thanks to that developer. As you can see, the device boots up no problem and acts like a normal DS. On the surface, something interesting to note is that there is no internal settings battery, so every time this unit is reset it will not natively retain any user settings like the user profile or time and date, instead reverting to a UID test and a system date of January 1st, 2000. There's also no ability for the Nitro emulator to read anything from a game card without interfacing first with the PC software to enable power via relay to the cartridge slots. This leads us into the software aspect of this device. The first step in getting the Nitro emulator to Nitro emulate is to install drivers, which can be found online with enough digging. Newer versions of Windows will attempt to install drivers for you automatically. I don't know if these work because I never tested them, but be my guest to test them out for yourself and see if they work out. The main software this device interfaces with is called IS Nitro Debugger and can also be found online with enough effort. This program would allow developers to run test builds of games and debug them if necessary. Officially, the software is only compatible with Windows XP 2000 up to Windows 7, but there are ways to get both the driver and the software working on Windows 10 with the right compatibility settings. For the purposes of this video, I'll install Windows XP on a virtual machine to get that authentic 2006 development experience. Nintendo of Europe put out a handful of Windows XP themes in the early 2000s based on consoles and games of the time, so let's go ahead and enable this frankly amazing GameCube theme to really feel like a Nintendo. The first IS debugger install file I found while searching for it online was clearly designed to be run on a Japanese PC. This was actually part of a complete rip of the Japanese version of the bundled software CD, which came with drivers, installers, and manuals, in addition to this cute little CD Explorer dialogue. I searched around a little more before luckily landing on a newer version of the software in English. With that installed and running, it's time to take a look at some of the functionality of this unique piece of software. After booting up, we are immediately thrown a hardware not found dialog, which we will resolve in due time, but first I want to list off some of the basic features and options we can see before even connecting the hardware or loading a game ROM. The workspace is divided into a number of different panels, with the main center window being a multi-purpose text editor, surrounded by a register monitor, an output monitor, a stack trace monitor, a thread list, as well as a file explorer and variable monitors. If we open up the about window, we can see some version information as well as some specific data about our unit had we connected it. Open homepage tries to take us to warioworld.com slash nitro, which is sadly no longer online and has no backups on the internet archive. In the same menu, we can send an email to the Nintendo of America support address if we want. Over in the options window, we can find our standard IDE preferences like font and background colors, but what's also here is this video output menu. You can see that all of this is currently disabled, and that would not change if we were to actually connect our unit, because again, our firmware doesn't have video output enabled natively, and I'm using a special third-party tool to allow it to happen. I want to quickly look at the help manual, which is really interesting to read and fairly comprehensive. I'll just briefly go over some of my favorite snippets. First, there's just some general overview information, a reminder that the device generates heat, some nice diagrams in the hardware description section, and such helpful insights about the controller as control buttons used to control the game, and power indicator LED displays the power state. Further down, there are some guidelines for using flashcards and game packs, along with some pretty dense information about project structure and debugging. Under description of features, there's some interesting hardware info related to memory mapping, clock settings, and wireless communications. I especially love this part of the manual because it recommends PictoChat as a valid means to test wireless functionality. As with the rest of the files mentioned in this video, the full manual is available online if you want to take a longer look at it yourself. Now let's actually connect our unit to the debugger by porting it through our VM. After an initial hardware reset, which is basically the CPUs reverting to their initial state, we can see that a lot more options have opened up to us on the toolbars. We can now load and save files, control functions of the cartridge slots, and control execution of a game actively being run. We can see controls like soft run, free run, come here, break current, etc. There's a debug button that exists to give developers an extra button to work with that can be assigned to do basically anything and maps to the power button on the physical DS controller. And lastly, we have a couple of hardware reset options that are used for resetting the emulator between executions. 
Now let's talk about actually using this thing to do something cooler than sit here and be a clock. For this part of the video, I'm gonna yeet on over to my Windows 7 VM because the video enabler just doesn't work on Windows XP. It's just, you, you try it and nope, just can't do it. Rest well, GameCube theme. I'm gonna level with you guys. I have no idea how to write a Nintendo DS game from scratch, nor do I own any DS flashcards, which I would need to actually load my own game onto the debugger. But thankfully, we've been blessed with a reality where hundreds of DS games already exist. Let me get a fistful of DS games. Hundreds of DS games. That's, that's hundreds. But before we get into running some of those, I want to talk about some test files included in the debugger install. They've really included all the most popular Nintendo IPs. You've got uh, Assembler, Download, who could forget Buck Upped. Let's try running this one called MIDI. I am devastated the public never got this masterpiece. Yeah, most of these folders just have some short code samples, with MIDI and Stream being the only ones with compiled ROM images. I was hoping maybe for something a little cooler, like, I don't know, a game? Nonetheless, these are interesting in their own right. With that having been covered, let's talk about the really exciting part. Playing retail DS games. Normally, retail DS ROMs are encrypted in development and decrypted as commercially sold games. The debugger can't open decrypted ROMs, but thankfully there's a tool called ndrifts that quickly converts any ROM you throw it. Just put a retail NDS file in the same directory as the program, run it, change the file type to something the debugger will recognize, and now your game ROM is ready to use. I'm going to use a ROM of Super Mario 64 DS as an example to show what happens when we load one of these converted games into the debugger. For one, we can now look at the ROM registration details, which will provide some basic info about what we've opened. If I go ahead and run the game with nothing inserted into the top of the emulator, it will, depending on the game, either completely refuse to load or allow the game to be played without saving. This is because the Nitro emulator has no internal memory for storing save data, so individual games will behave differently depending on how strictly they require save media to be present. If I were actually developing a game, I would use a flash cartridge to be that save media. Thankfully, we can work around this requirement for any given game if we big brain it and instead use the actual retail game card. Bet you didn't think of that one, Nintendo. I've been able to use this method to successfully load and save for every game I tried, except for some reason, Kirby Mass Attack. To demonstrate this process, we can stick a game into the emulator and turn power to the slot on. After the debugger hits us with this really weirdly phrased warning, we'll go ahead and run our game, which will now be able to access valid save data. To reiterate what's happening here, the game ROM, being basically everything except the save data, is being sent to the emulator's SDRAM from the PC. The one missing piece of the game, the save data, is being provided by whatever game card you physically inserted. If you mismatch the save data with the loaded game, it could potentially corrupt the save beyond repair, but as long as you match the right game card and ROM image, you can play and save pretty much any retail DS game as if it were on an actual DS, with one main caveat being that you can't play wireless multiplayer with other DS systems without having the wireless option for the hardware. One really interesting effect of the system I just described relates to the paired versions of Pokemon DS games being Diamond and Pearl, Heart Gold and Soul Silver, Black and White, and Black and White 2. As a disclaimer, I've only explicitly tested this with Diamond and Pearl, but I'm just assuming this translates to the other pairs as well. What I found out is that there doesn't appear to be any identifier that distinguishes Pokemon Diamond save data from Pokemon Pearl save data, or at least none that gets checked during play. This means that a save file from Pearl could be accessed using a ROM of Diamond, or vice versa. And what this lets you do is catch and save version-exclusive Pokémon normally unobtainable on that version of the game. You can then access them from the correct version of the game on real DS hardware. On the topic of save data, the debugger is also capable of saving and restoring backups of physical game saves. All you need to know first is the size of the save file that's being backed up, and just like that, you'll birth a beautiful baby bin file, which you can actually use with a normal software emulator if you were to accidentally annihilate your DS one day. You can also utilize this feature to swap out and copy saves at will, so if you ever wanted to restart Pokemon or Animal Crossing, you'd be able to do so without losing your old save data. 
Now that we have retail games up and running in the debugger, it's time to play around with some of the execution and debug controls. The first step to having any sense of what's going on as a game is running is by using the disassembler. This converts the raw machine code of the game ROM into a much more digestible ARM assembly variant, with each line representing one instruction. This is different from the actual source code of the game, which had to be first compiled from some high-level language like C or C++ into assembly, and then into machine code before it was released. Now before you ask, it's unfortunately pretty much impossible to reverse engineer the disassembled ROM to piece together the original source code, at least into anything remotely readable. That's why whenever the source code of a decades old game leaks today, it's still a big deal. From the disassembler view, we can set some breakpoints in the disassembled code. These are common tools in debugging for selecting particular instructions where the program execution should pause before continuing. Doing this allows the program state at that point in time to be analyzed by a developer who's trying to figure out what the heck is going on with their code. Along the bottom edge of the debugger, there's a panel for managing these breakpoints as you create and modify them. Moving on to some other features, the soft run option runs the loaded game taking those breakpoints into account while free run does not. This debug button, as I mentioned earlier, can have some user-defined debug function or macro map to it. In the user manual, Nintendo says that an application containing debug button processing can be released without concern since the button is not physically present on a consumer DS. This makes me wonder if there are any DS games that might have a secret leftover debug mode that could be found using this software. I'll definitely play around with that some more and mention later if I find anything interesting. The step control will cycle one instruction per click and is useful for ensuring specific instructions behave like they should. And the rest of the debug controls are essentially variants of the step control to be used in different scenarios. Execute will run up to a certain instruction with an address input by the user. Trace will execute up until the start of the next called function. Similarly, step out will execute until the running function returns to its calling function. If you're bored so far, don't major in CS. Come here will execute up to the current cursor position in the disassembler. And finally, break current can be used to essentially pause the game execution wherever you want. This last one is really fun to mess around with because you can just pause games entirely at moments they weren't designed to be. Whenever execution is paused by any of these controls, the debugger will display the current executing instruction, all of the stored CPU register values, the current function call stack, the list of program threads and their statuses, and a memory dump both from the CPU caches and the save data memory. If we had access to the source code of the running game, the debugger would display this information as actual variable and function names, but sadly for now we have to settle for this hexadecimal soup. One final feature to discuss is that, through the use of a weird workaround, Game Boy Advance games can also be played on the Nitro emulator, even though I'm pretty sure they weren't supposed to be. If you manually reset the emulator and then open the debugger with no ROM image loaded, insert a GBA cartridge, power the slot, and click Game Banner under the Tools menu, the standard DS menu will be displayed on the controller. And from there, you'll be able to launch and play any GBA game like normal. If the debugger already had a game ROM loaded, this menu option would still be there, but touching it would do... nothing. While playing them through the Nitro emulator, GBA games can be saved to and loaded from without any special effort or hassle. Although, if the hardware is reset while a GBA game is running, there will be this really threatening transmission error. If you still weren't sure if the ability to play GBA games was intentional or not, here's the debugger itself labeling it... illegal. So that about wraps up all I wanted to cover in this video. The IS Nitro emulator is a truly unique device, and it's been really enjoyable for me to try and figure out how to get it to do some interesting things over the time that I've owned it. I think it's fun to imagine the games that I grew up with being developed and debugged on hardware very similar to this, if not this exact hardware. Development hardware is an area that often gets overlooked by a lot of game historians and preservationists, and I hope that this video can act as a sort of time capsule for a piece of technology fading further into obscurity by the day. Thanks so much for watching. I don't know if I'm going to make this type of video recurring since it took really long to make, but go ahead and comment if you enjoyed it or have suggestions for how I can improve. 
Special thanks to the people who have developed software tools or just contributed knowledge to this super niche topic, and as a reminder, I've linked to any relevant sources and forum posts in the description.